All right, again, we have a very quick pace introduction into states of matter and phase changes. Please take notes, uh, pay attention. You can pause and replay the video if you need. So if you Google states of matter, you'll find as many as 15 states of matter. Uh, that's pretty extreme. Now, if you're a science student, I do suggest looking into oobleck, glasses, body armor, um, plasma, Newtonian liquids, um, the Bose-Einstein state of matter and weird stuff like that. It's really cool. But here in the chemistry class um, at the university, we primarily discuss the three fundamental states of matter. All right? Solids, liquids, and gases. Now, we all have seen various kinds of weather. If it rains, water is coming down as liquid. If it snows or hails, water is coming down as a solid form. And eventually everything dries out. Where does that water go? Well, it transforms into invisible water vapor or steam and goes away. So let's talk about solids. Here's a summary table I urge you to uh, write down and fill in on the worksheet as we go along. If you're not in my class, use a blank sheet of paper to try to fill in this uh, sheet of summary uh, characteristics for all the different uh, states. So solids have a definite shape. It doesn't matter if we have a cubic or a rectangular solid or round sphere or anything else. Here we have crystals of copper 2 sulfate pentahydrate and it forms these beautiful clusters shown here or if it's a single crystal a uh, very nice hexagonal shape. All right and the shape of a solid is definite. It's fixed. It doesn't change. Now we say a liquid however varies its shape. So a liquid can adopt the shape of its container, and you have some picture of some honey jars here. The one on the left, uh, the liquid honey adopts the shape of a cylinder, and the honey jar on the right, it adopts the shape of a teddy bear, okay? So since liquids are shape shifters, we say that the shape is indefinite or varies. Now, First of all, when we say gas in chemistry, we're talking about a vapor or gaseous substance. And when you go to the uh, gas station to fill up your gas tank, um, that's refer uh, referring to gasoline, which is a liquid fuel. That, that's something else. We're talking about gases that uh, exist in the atmosphere, for example. All right. Now, the shape of a gas is only defined based on the type of container that holds it. Um, so it's indefinite or varies. The helium gas in this picture is roughly in the shape of the cylinder when it's in that red compressed uh, gas tank, or it takes the shape of the balloons when it's filled into all these different helium balloons, okay? So these are different shapes. So gases are also shape shifters and adopt the shape of their container, and we say their shape is indefinite or varies. Now what about volume? Volume is the extent or amount of space an object occupies. Uh, please don't confuse the uh, volume with a shape, okay? We're not, don't confuse round with uh, cubic. Uh, we're talking about how big or small something is. So that's what volume is. Now this slide shows a few formulas for the volumes of various objects. Uh, you can Google these if they're too small to see on your electronic device. But a sphere's volume is calculated from the radius, which is the point from the middle to the perimeter of the sphere. A box is calculated, of course, as we know, probably by multiplying the length uh, times the width times the height, okay, for a box. So all three uh, dimensions, x, y, z. And then a cone is calculated from both the radius and the height using the formula shown on this slide. Now what about liquids? Liquids take on the shape of their uh, container, as we have discussed, and they don't have a defined volume, all right? So US, a U.S. cup of milk will still be a cup of milk when it's poured into a mixing bowl as you prepare to make biscuits. So the volume doesn't change there as it goes from one container to the next, but its shape does, all right? The volume doesn't magically increase or decrease, however. A cup of milk is always a cup of milk. Now, we normally measure liquids with graduated cylinders, maybe a flask or a beaker, kind of a beaker is kind of here with a handle. Uh, this is the reason we don't technically have volume formulas for liquids. However, if you were to say have a rectangular uh, fish aquarium that was filled up with water, you could calculate the volume of water in there by using the volume of a rectangle. 
right? Length times width times height, for example. Now, what about the volume of gases? The volume of a gas is undefined and varies, okay? The helium tank pictured here, as we saw, is quite small and contains pressurized helium. The helium can be squished into a small volume, okay? Um, now, this tank here is rated to fill 50 helium balloons, which is a much larger volume. And it turns out that the gases have indefinite volume that will vary with the container that holds the gas, okay? If a helium balloon is taken into this room here and popped, uh, it's going to diffuse out and occupy the volume of this new container, which is the volume of a room, okay? Now, we're going to learn later on in this class about the volume of gases and how they strongly depend on temperature and pressure. And it turns out it's so much more easier to calculate, uh, to just measure the temperature and pressure of a gas and then say just calculate the volume using some chemistry formulas we're going to learn later on. Now let's talk about the particle arrangement here. A solid is composed of very small particles that we can't see, either atoms or molecules. Now these particles are tightly packed in a rigid arrangement and regular arrangement. So you can kind of think of the arrangement of particles like the oranges in this box on this slide. Okay, this is a box of oranges. Now all the oranges here are arranged in a very regular and repeating arrangement in rows, columns, and, and also in, in three dimensions. This arrangement is sometimes called a lattice or a crystalline lattice, and that's a perfectly good uh, analogy of solids, okay? In the, in the cylinder there, we have that little green box, and that's composed of these little green balls. Those are representing atoms as well, okay? Now, liquids also, of course, are composed of very small particles we call atoms or molecules. Now, these particles are loosely packed in an irregular or fluid-like arrangement. There's no regularity. There's no repeating pattern that can be seen here, okay? Now, if you were to be able to see it, it would look random, and that's the word I've used to describe this in the summary table. Now, you can think of the arrangement of particles as a cup of uncooked rice, uh, shown here on the very left side, uh, side of the slide. And these grains of rice are tumbling around. They're orientated in many different directions and orientations, which means irregular, okay? So uh, irregular means not regular, okay? The arrangement is quite random. And we call this the fluid or fluid-like state. And there's a picture there um, of the particles in the uh, sphere, I mean, in, in the uh, cylinder, I mean. And you can see how the particles are, are randomly orientated. You'll also see that the liquid does not completely fill the container, okay? Liquids, you know, your glass can be half full or half empty, for example. And that's the case here with this liquid. Now, gases are composed of atoms or molecules, of course. In this figure, we have a container in the shape of a cylinder containing some diatomic gas. Now, a diatomic gas is, is a molecule of gases where you have two spheres or two atoms stuck together. So that's why you look like you got two balls there with each of the particles, okay? Now, as you can see, it completely fills the container. So those gas molecules are completely throughout this, uh, the cylinder, okay? They spread out and they completely fill that container. But the thing to men uh, mention here and pay attention to is that they are very loose and they're mostly composed of empty space, okay? There's a lot of distance between particles, so it's mostly just empty space. And this explains why if we put a piston or a plunger on that, we could squish the gas into a smaller volume. So they have random orientations and they are irregularly spaced. An everyday analogy of the arrangement of gases can be seen here uh, with some uh, sprinklers on somebody's lawn in the very bottom left corner of this slide. Uh, the water's just spraying everywhere and the droplets of water are randomly distributed throughout the, um, the air. So in summary, we've got the arrangement of particles here of the three fundamental states of matter. The gas on the very left is shown as a diatomic molecule, but this doesn't have to be the case. Uh, but anyways, both gases and liquids are very random or irregular, okay? Gases completely fill the container. Liquids and solids don't. Both gases 
and, and liquids, as you can see, have random arrangements, right? They're irregular. And the solid, on the, on, on the other hand, is very regular in its arrangement, okay? It's very uh, tightly packed. Um, it's systematic. It's a lattice, okay? All right, here's a practice problem. Which of the following pictures do you think represent a liquid? Now, the spheres represent atoms. In order to answer this question, you're going to have to think carefully about particle arrangement. And we also need to think about the extent of the filling of the container. Do you remember which states completely fill the container or partially fill the container? How were the atoms packed? Were they regular, irregular? OK. So what do you think the answer is? I am not going to tell you the answer. So I'm going to move on now. Now let's talk about movement of solids. The best way to discuss movement is with a picture where things are actually moving. So this animation very well describes the movement of atoms or molecules in a solid. Normally, we think of a solid as very rigid, inanimate, and fixed. It's a chunk of metal, and it's solid. It's sitting there on the desk. Of course, nothing's moving, right? However, at the molecular scale, we can see that there is vibration of atoms in the material. And all molecular motion ceases to exist at the lowest achievable temperature, which is zero Kelvin. All right, zero Kelvin is uh, the lowest temperature achievable, and that's when all motion would cease. However, at room temperature, which is quite warm compared to zero Kelvin, atoms of copper, for example, in this figure, are rapidly vibrating in place as shown in this animation. So the atoms are just kind of uh, jiggling in space, but they're not moving or rotating or tumbling around the box, OK? You can also see, once again, they're tightly packed, and it's a very regular lattice. All right. This animation shows the particle movement of liquids. And so what you've got here is a, a random arrangement of a, a collection of grouped up um, atoms. You do have some escaped atoms that are kind of like trying to escape away. Those might represent water vapor, for example. And the bulk liquid there would be the liquid uh, state of the, of the animation here. And you can see how particles don't have a regular arrangement. They're just random in there. But they're very close to each other, and they are touching. Okay, So this is a perfect animation for um, uh, liquids. Okay, So in a liquid, all modes of movement are available. I've listed them here on the slide. Vibration, translation, and rotation. We'll talk about those three in just a bit. And finally, we have gases. Gases are a very chaotic form of matter. Molecules or atoms are moving very quickly, bouncing off the container walls. And again, this animation shows that you have mostly empty space. And there's all types of uh, movement. Okay, There's vibration, uh, there's rotation, and then there's uh, translation. All right, so what, what does this mean, vibration, translation, and rotation? Well, this slide summarizes the types of movements in cases you're unfamiliar with the terms. Okay. So vibration means that atoms or molecules vibrate in space. Uh, a water molecule, for example, can, can flex and vibrate. Or a copper atom can just vibrate in space. Okay? And that's indicated by those little arcs there. It's a little cartoon things. Okay? Now, translation means that atoms or molecules physically move from one place to another. While that is happening, there can be vibration or there could be rotation as that occurs. But anyways, translation is moving from one place to another. Okay. And finally, when you have a rotation, that's indicated here on the very right figure uh, <clears throat> with a diatomic uh, gas molecule, uh, which is two conjoined um, atoms. Okay. Uh, I might, well, I don't have anything like that. I have something very complicated here. But um, rotation is, of course, just what it means. As this molecule is moving through space, it can be tumbling okay, around and rotating. Okay? So rotation is like this or like this. Okay? And so if you have a diatomic gas like nitrogen gas, for example, the uh, atoms can be just spinning around. Okay? So that's a great review slide if you want to take little notes and write down what vibration, translation, and rotation means in your own words. 
All right, let's look at some examples of these states of materials. Now, we haven't been through a lot of chemistry yet, so we'll try to pick things that we're all familiar with. Now, examples of solids include sodium chloride. Sodium chloride, as we've seen before, is a crystalline material and is commonly known as table salt. It's composed of alternating arrangements of sodium and chloride ions in a very regular and rigid matrix. So remember the box of oranges? Well, pretend like you had to ship somebody a box of oranges and apples, and you wanted to be creative and have apple, orange, apple, orange, apple, orange in an alternating arrangement. That's kind of what sodium chloride looks like. Steel is made by mixing various amounts of carbon with iron. Okay, so here in this figure, the blue spheres represent iron atoms, and the black spheres represent carbon. Okay, and it turns out that uh, you have a very rigid matrix of iron atoms that are regularly spaced, but then also you have the black carbon atoms that can fit within the spaces inside of the iron. Okay, and that strengthens uh, raw iron and, and it makes steel. Liquids, we've uh, not experienced too many. Like if you think in your mind right now, what liquids do you know of? You might think water, alcohol, gasoline, and then that's it, right? So as we go through chemistry, we'll learn a whole lot more liquid, a number of liquids. But common everyday examples of liquids include unleaded gasoline. Here's someone on the bottom left is uh, filling up their lawnmower with some gasoline, okay? Everyone's familiar with drinking water that comes out of faucets, so that's the obvious example of water that we're very familiar with. What you might not know is that kitchen and bathroom faucets have a small little screen underneath where the water comes out on the faucet, and that serves as an aerator, and that's why you can see tiny little bubbles of gas in the water that's coming out, and that does two things. It reduces the volume of water, so it saves water a little bit, and it reduces the tendency of that water to splash out of the sink or wash basin. Gases. We can't see gases because they're invisible. Uh, the air in this room is a gas. Many gases are just colorless. Smog is brown. You can look up in the sky and maybe see a brown haze, okay? But they're invisible. So what I have are some pictures of some containers that are used to hold some everyday gases we are familiar with. Everybody knows helium balloons. And helium is a lighter than air gas, so that's why the helium balloons float. All right? This air compressor is designed to pressurize air and deliver it to shop tools, for example, like an air gun or something. Air is a mixture of nitrogen, oxygen, carbon dioxide, and other trace gases. On a very humid day, it might conclude, include a lot of water vapor as well. So what have we learned from this small tutorial? We've learned the three fundamental states of matter, which are solids, liquids, and gases. You've seen the four characteristics of these states of matter and seen some common examples of states of matter. Okay. As you can see, there's a lot more than you initially thought. Thanks for watching. Please subscribe, give a thumbs up, and take a look at the other videos in this playlist. Have a great afternoon, everybody.